Hey there, Dengas2 here. Today's video is a Q&A session and is proudly sponsored by MarineEngine.com. It's late in the afternoon now, a little bit frazzled from the sun, as you can probably tell. Uh, but let's go back to the morning when I started working on a little bit of electrical work. Not lots of it, don't panic. I know you're not a huge fan of it, from what I can tell. But uh, it was important just to get the camera running properly, so we'll pick up there. I won't film the whole thing though, because I know you guys kind of get a bit bored with just plugging things in. The backbone of the electrics are in, and that's what makes adding new devices really, really easy hook up the positive negative to the fuse board, put in the correct fuse, put a switch if it's needed, plug it in. I'll show it to you though. This is the one I'm gonna use. So I've got a 60 watt USB-C, which will do the laptop and the GoPro, and then just a USB-A, which I can use, so what is it, a four amp or something, that I can use just for all sorts of bits and bobs. It takes nine to 24 volts, which to me is slightly ambiguous. Um, I'm thinking I won't run it on my 24 volt side because, uh, you know, when it's charging, it's fully charged, it's 25 up to 28 volts or something. And I don't know whether it means up to 24 as in a 24 volt system or 24 volts is the peak voltage it accepts. But 9 to 24, so run off the 12, no dramas. Anyway, I'll wire this in, then we'll get on with the Q&A. Uh, on the back here, comes with some pins like this and a plug that has screws down. So I'm just gonna put a couple of these ferrules, I think they're called, bootlace ends onto the wires, crimp those on, and then we'll mash that down here. So I'll just find the right size ones. I'd say about this black size. Okay, turned out to be this blue size. And the crimpers for these are these cool sort of, uh, if you see them that way, but they sort of just all four sides come in and crimp it pretty well. Alright, that's on nice and tight. Do the positive. Alright. Crimp down the positive. Alright, there we go. Powered up. Let's plug this camera in before it goes flat and uh, get on with the Q&A. All right, now we actually do have power in the camera. I'll go through the questions that people have been asking both in comments and also people who put their questions on that YouTube community page where I ask, you know, what do you want to know? So number one really is what's happening with the engine. That's probably the most common question I get. And it's coming along. I think I'll have it back next week, fingers crossed. But what I did is yesterday I jumped into CDA, just popped in to have a look and see where things were at and it's getting there. The bottom end's all together, the pistons are in, all that kind of stuff. Uh, the main problem actually was that I'd ordered the wrong camshaft, my bad, not CDA's problem at all. And now the new one's there, Mitch who's doing the bulk of the work on it, he's going to start putting the new camshaft in, the correct camshaft in, and then get the cylinder head onto the block. CDA I thought made a very good call in that I gave them all the documentation for the engine, they said look, every second paragraph says use special tool XYZ. And I pointed to one of Scott's videos from Bus Grease Monkey where he had sent a cylinder head off to be fixed. And the company that did it didn't have a good awareness of how to set the depth on the injectors properly. You have to ream out the tubes, etc. And I had got some new tubes from Cutting Edges. Big thanks to those guys for supplying those parts. And they kind of wisely said, look, you know what, we're just going to get those done by a Detroit specialist. So they outsourced that and that's now done. So I had a look at those and they're looking awesome. So I'm huge confidence that when the engine comes back, it's going to be 100%. But it's just going to take another week or so, that's all. Most of the delays have been due to problems with parts, which has been uh, really my fault, to be honest with you. Um, I got the wrong camshaft because I didn't check, you know, I just saw a cheap one, went perfect, let's get it. Um, it was obviously for a Detroit diesel 471, but it was for a left-hand engine, not a right-hand engine. Then also it turned out that the sleeves for the cylinder liners needed to be oversized. The block had been machined before, so the sleeves I had weren't big enough. 
So I now have a set of standard sleeves and a left hand rotation camshaft if you want them. But anyway, that's where the engine's at. Hoping to get it back. When I get, when I get it back from CDA, I'll get it sent to the old workshop where I did the earlier videos. Well, the mid-range videos, not the real early ones. And uh, then we'll start putting the blower onto it. We'll put the heat exchangers back on, all that kind of stuff. Once I've finished with all that work, we'll be ready to drop it back in the boat and we'll be underway. Another really common question before uh, it gets too dark outside is about... Am I worried about water getting onto the electrical board that's in the lazarette? I'll show you the situation lazarette so you get a sense of how it's actually configured and I'll tell you what I'm thinking. Here's all my uh, copper bits and pieces. Okay, the first thing to notice, if you look straight down, the board's actually set back. The board itself actually sits about here. So if water runs down here, it actually runs in front of the board. People are also commenting about things, you know, debris or whatever dropping into the sockets on the inverter when it's this way up. Yes, I could put it horizontally. It's probably better for heat as well. I don't know, maybe. But... You can just get sockets for these, you know, plugs that go into sockets. So I could put those in. The other thing is I could just leave a couple of these short extension cords in, then there's no issue there. But the other thing is the opening here to the lazarette ends and it's actually inset. So there's no way that water can drop straight down and go onto the board at all. Doesn't mean it's completely protected, but what it does mean is I can actually even attach a bit of a curtain around here, have it come down, and you know, it's pretty much gonna be protected then. Another thing I'm thinking of doing is getting some six or eight mil fuel line, cutting it down one side, feeding it all the way along the top here, maybe put some Sikaflex on top first, pressing it down, then it'll seal against the hatch here, and I think that'll be pretty watertight. So that's what's happening there anyway. It's certainly nowhere near as exposed as I think perhaps it does look from other angles. All right, what I think I'll do now is just start going through the questions people posted on the YouTube community page and we'll just go through them by one by one. So first question is, um, will I get another workshop? So the workshop is actually owned by Arne and I and we bought it 50-50 using our superannuation money, which is the sort of money that you put aside. So as you work over time, your employer puts, uh, I think it's like 9% of your wage into a fund that's designed to fund your retirement. And, you know, I've worked in IT, worked all sorts of jobs, and all this money gets put away. But an option you have in Australia is to, instead of having that locked up in a particular large company, AMP or whatever, you know, their super fund, you can start a self-managed super fund. And that's what we both did. And we took that money and invested it in the workshop. And then you get the return on that in the form of rent. So it's not money I can access until I retire, but I could buy the workshop with it, at least half of it. So Arne and I bought that workshop, we own it, well our self-managed super funds own it, and we now have Dean, who's another mechanic, running his own business from that shop. But it's the shop I'm gonna get the Detroit Diesel sent to so that I can work on it, he's cool with that, you know. It's technically his workshop, he rents it from us, but he's fine, he even said he'd give me a hand. So that's the story with the workshop. If Dean leaves one day, you know, he may, he may buy it off us, who knows what the future holds sort of thing, but currently it is our workshop that we own and we rent it to someone else. On a related note, the next question is, what's the most surprising thing you learnt while you are in the US? And initially it was about the way various taxes work, very different structure to us here in Australia. But the other thing I learnt when I was at marineengine.com, I was speaking to one of the guys there, and he said, oh, I used to work in a garage. And I said, oh, did you study? He goes, no, 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 I just worked in a garage. And in Australia, you can't work on a car unless you've done a four-year apprenticeship and been licensed. So I got the impression that, from talking to him, that it was okay if you had the skills and an employer trusted you, you know, and your customers trusted you, that it was okay to work on cars if you didn't have a license. And that was probably one of the most surprising things. Here, we've, you know, you just kind of think about working on a car commercially if you're not licensed. So 
that was probably the most surprising difference I saw. Everything else, you know, it's, it's, it's life as usual, people doing their thing and, you know, I think the more you travel, the more you realise that the world is pretty much the same everywhere you go. But, but that was something I wasn't expecting anyway. Uh, next question was, um, you know, what did you used to do before you did YouTube as a job, which is a part of another question. But uh, the answer to that is is quite long winded. Did a lot of things. Uh, did a lot of work in IT. Also worked on the water, doing a, sort of a compliance role as a boating service officer for New South Wales Maritime or Waterways as it started. It's quite a long story though, so I've written up a little bit of a bio and I've got a link to that in the description. So if you want to know the full catastrophe, the link's in the description. I'll let you read it. It's going to be shorter. Ah, here we go. Next question is, uh, does your wife get jealous of the time you spend working on the boat? And the answer is probably no, in the sense that up until the start of this year when I bought the boat, I've always had a day job and done the YouTube as a part-time thing. The first four years of running the channel, I worked full-time and did the videos in my spare time. Now that the trawler came along and there was definitely an increased interest in that, it wasn't really expected, but it just happened that way. And that's actually allowed me to make YouTube my full-time job at the moment. It makes enough money to survive, you know? You're not gonna get rich on it probably, but it means that you can just dedicate your week to it. So what it actually means is that we see more of each other because uh, you know, I can start a bit late if I want. I've got the freedom of not having to be at work at a particular time. And then I'm home on the weekends. You know, I try to keep the work on the trawler to Monday to Friday. So instead of going to work Monday to Friday, doing some YouTube stuff on the weekend and evenings, it means that I try to treat it like a job and work Monday to Friday, nine to five as much as I can. So in some ways we actually see more of each other because of the trawler project than we did before. So it's kind of a bit paradoxical, but that's the way it's panned out. And I'm definitely very happy about that, you know, and she is too. So look, it's not easy. Um, you get a lot of negative comments from people saying, oh, you know, Patreon's e-begging and you know, some guy telling me I was a bum for playing around on boats all day or whatever. And it's like, it, it's not easy. It's not. If it was, everyone would do it. And I'm not, I don't mean that to sound um, arrogant or whatever. It's just, it's just not easy. It's not for everyone. You know, you do it and uh, it takes a lot of hard work, but it's a good job. You know, it, it's, it's not a job that you're guaranteed to succeed at. Um, like all things, you know, you give it your best shot and sometimes it doesn't work out. And at the moment, I'm lucky in that it does work out. You know, it is working out. The my, I guess my greatest fear with it in some ways is that it's uh, it's very fickle. You know, the market for advertising drops and, and suddenly you're doing the same work for no money. You know, there's no guarantees. But I figure, you know, run with it while it's happening. And uh, if it turns out that it stops happening, well, so be it. You know, I've always worked. I've always had a career. I've always, you know, had a full-time job. And I'll just go back to doing that. But... Uh, it's certainly what YouTube enables me to do at the moment, mm -hmm. and it's certainly what the Patreon supporters really enable because the market for YouTube is interesting in that advertising pays based on a kind of a, a market. It's very volatile, it's a bit like a stock market. You can be getting the same number of views and earn a lot less money because the market drops out of the advertising market. You know, I don't want to bore you too much with the ins and outs of YouTube, but that's the way it works. All right, next question says, uh, I should give you names probably, this is Nias. Sorry, I feel slack I didn't give the names earlier, I was planning to, but then I forgot. Um, uh, says, outboards seem more reliable and quiet than inboard diesel engines. Um, this seems illogical, um, as it looks like diesels are built to last forever. What are your thoughts? So outboards are interesting in that, okay, petrol's quieter than diesel, that's all there is to it. You know, low compression engines, quieter. There's a lot of mechanical noise from diesels, which is why I'm going to be doing a lot of insulating on the engine bay. I personally think diesels probably are more reliable. I wouldn't say outboards are more reliable. I think they're less reliable. I do. Uh, the great thing about them is you can just take it off, put a new one on, fix it, whatever. They're very accessible, very easy to work on in that sense. They're definitely not quieter. Uh, definitely wouldn't go petrol inboard because petrol is very volatile, very flammable. Um, it's not a great thing, I think, to have inside an enclosed engine bay. That's why most petrol engines seem to be outboards. 
But uh, I would say the only thing that perhaps that makes diesels less reliable is it is high compression, high pressure fuel. There's a lot of strain on those components. They're built very solidly because of that, but um, those strains can cause, you know, uh, ruptures, issues with fuel delivery and, you know, issues with the block. Mm, probably not actually, I've got to say. Even though they're higher compression engines, they're just built so strong and they rev so low, they have such low RPM that they tend to last a long time. So I would say petrol definitely quieter, diesel definitely more reliable. Certainly also when you're pushing a big boat like this, you just burn, I mean, they talk about the difference between a cruising boat with diesel and a sailboat. You know, a sailboat, low carbon footprint, uh, low fuel consumption, you can sail around the world. You know, they did before they even invented the engine. So I would say sail has the best, obviously, almost no fuel consumption, other than perhaps berthing, docking, being in the doldrums, whatever. Diesel uses much less fuel than a petrol motor too. So petrol is quieter, but very thirsty from a fuel point of view. Diesel's more reliable, uses less fuel, sail, okay, you're at the mercy of the elements, but from the point of view of cruising long distances, crossing the world, you know, you can't beat it. So that's probably where the three kind of fit in the spectrum. Somebody else asked, would you rather a strip screw or a snap bolt? Uh, Joel asked this, and that's a good question. Um, probably a snap bolt, I think, because bolts, there's enough meat in them to kind of get a drill bit in, get an easy out, that kind of thing. So I think when a bolt snaps, the larger the diameter, I think the better chance you've got of getting it out. That That's my personal feeling anyway. Fun question. So another question was, how did you get so good with small engines and mechanic work as a whole? And that's kind of an interesting question that I came to mechanical work later in life. I lived on Dangar Island for 20 years now and working with outboards was just essential. You had to get your boat running. There's no bridge to the island, there's no car ferry. In order to get from the mainland to Dangar Island, you have to get in a boat, that's all there is to it. So very quickly you start learning to work on your own engines and, and you know keep them running. Then Arne and I started the workshop. Arne's been a qualified mechanic his whole life, you know, since high school. And I did my apprenticeship uh, under Arne. He was the licensed mechanic and I did my apprenticeship and now I'm a licensed mechanic thanks to Arne's tutelage. Uh, so that's kind of the, the short version, but really the mechanical stuff was about living on the island and needing to keep outboards running just as a resident. But the rest of the training was through Arne as a car mechanic at the workshop. Ah, very good question. Next one is, oh, sorry, I'm not even going to try and pronounce it, but it is, uh, do you feel better about your decision to refurbish your motor versus buying new? And it's a very good question. In hindsight, I think buying new would have made more sense if it wasn't about the YouTube channel. I think to me, a lot of this refurbishment has to be seen in the context of the channel. It does, you know. Um, I'm happy that I'm building the boat that I want to own. I'm not planning to sell it. Like I want to keep this boat. I want to use it for the things I want to use. It's a boat I'm happy to own, but it has been expensive doing the motor much more than I thought it would be. And there were definitely smaller, more fuel efficient engines I could have bought to replace the Detroit and pop them in giving myself a bit more engine based space because it would have been a smaller engine, it would have been a more fuel efficient engine. But having said that, I'm happy having the Detroit because they're kind of an iconic motor. They're pretty cool. I've grown to really like them since I've been working with this one and learning more about them. And I like the idea of this small boat that has a lot of power. It's probably twice the power the boat needs but it'll actually make it a very good work boat. It can tow things, it'll be able to push barges. It's not just a pleasure cruising boat. And in that sense, I think the engine suits the boat well. The other thing to consider is that by having the engine refurbished and doing some of the work myself, I know that engine very well now. I understand how it works and the components. Also, when you buy a new motor, a uh, new engine, Sorry, people always say me, motors are electric. Uh, but you know, when you buy a new engine, if it's significantly different from the engine that was in there, there's actually a lot of work to do to 
do the change. People have actually said to me, they swapped engines, they spent 15 grand on an engine and it cost them 15 grand to get it installed because everything changed. So in that sense, I'm probably still slightly ahead of the game, putting the exact same engine back in. Uh, the ballast won't change, the engine weighs the same obviously, same inlet, outlet directions, same gearbox flange, all that kind of stuff. So I'm not unhappy about it, but it's touch and go whether a new engine would have been a better choice if it was purely a financial logistic decision and you just went, look, I don't care, get rid of it, new one in. Maybe a small four-stroke diesel, half the horsepower would have been perfect for this boat, but yeah, you know. Uh, another question is why Dangar Island? Because uh, it was cheap. You know, uh, uh, Vicky, my partner, my wife, um, she knew a friend, she travelled with a friend in Greece years and years ago when she was young, um, who lived on Dangar Island, and that's how we knew the island existed, really. She just heard of it from a friend, and we'd been renting, and we were looking to buy. We came to the island, had a look around, and the properties are much cheaper than the rest of Sydney because it's hard to get to. If you want to buy a property and you don't have a lot of money, buying somewhere inconvenient is a really good way to save a lot of money. The um, people just want to drive their car to the door. If you can't do that, property prices instantly half, quarter, whatever. Um, we don't live on the waterfront, we live up the hill a bit, so we can't even drive a boat to a door. So it's what we sacrificed in convenience, we gained in affordability, and that's really why we ended up on Dangar Island. Uh, another question, why did I change my mind about a 12 volt house system going to a 24 volt? There's two main reasons. The one, it all started with a phone call to Jeff from Pacific Gulf Systems. Jeff's been very, you know, very, he just knows boat electrics inside out. They've, Pacific Gulf Systems have lots of videos on YouTube. Uh, so if you're interested in electrical stuff, which I know many of you aren't, <laughs> but if you are, check out Jeff's videos or Pacific Yacht Systems videos because he goes through it in great detail. I spoke to him uh, from a mate's house once in the country. He rang and I said, oh, Jeff, how you going? And we had a chat. And he said, if you have a 12 volt house system, how are you gonna start your engine if your starting batteries are flat? And that, I know it sounds obvious, we talk about it, but things aren't obvious when you haven't had a chance to think about it. And as soon as he said that, I went, right, you've sold me. That's just a no brainer now. We have to have a backup for starting. It's a 24 volt boat, 24 volt starter motor. We need two 24 volt battery banks. The other thing is, um, in order to get a certain amount of watts, it's volts times amps. So the, amperage or the the current that you send through a through a cable dictates how big the cable needs to be the higher the voltage the lower the amps to get the same watts and so it means that suddenly all your cabling can be thinner which is cheaper more flexible all sorts of things so eventually it became a no-brainer yep 24 volt starting 24 volts house bank then there were a couple of high current draw, such as the crane that stopped working, but high current draw 12 volt appliances that I didn't want to run through some sort of step down transformer. So I've got the single 12 volt battery that is charged from the 24 volt system using that Red Arc BC-DC charger, DC-DC charger essentially. And that's gonna be great for like jump starting tinnies, that kind of thing, because I will use it as a working boat. We'll do mechanical work from the boat once it's up and running. And so in the end, I went, right, two batteries, 24 starting, which are lead acid, two batteries, 24 volt AGM for house, and then a third AGM as a 12 volt for running the winch predominantly but also for just other 12 volt systems that you know can only be run that way. So that was the phone call really that changed my mind completely. So thank you, Jeff. I think you saved me a world of hurt and I really appreciate your advice. And if you're wiring a boat and you want some good advice, I really recommend you contact Pacific Yacht Systems because they offer a remote service. You don't have to be located. They don't necessarily want to do the work. They do offer a consulting service. 
and a bit of good advice at the start of a project can save you a lot of heartache down the track. Uh, one other question was, did you purchase any parts for the Detroit Diesel 471 while you're in the States and get them sent back? The answer is no. Uh, but Gary Smith, a guy I met at the Pasadena meetup, a uh, lovely guy, you know, mad keen voter, you know, it was fun talking to him. He gave me some stuff. He gave me, uh, I, I don't know if you remember, I had the main pump, but I also had a deck wash pump or a bilge pump that went off that sea chest, the manifold. And he gave me a Jabsco pump he'd rebuilt, but it also has a 12 volt or 24, I can't remember, but an electric clutch on it as well. And he gave me that, which I, I threw a whole lot of clothes away and I, I put this pump in my suitcase and brought it home. So thanks to Gary, I have this pump that I'm gonna use to reconnect that, uh, that manifold, that sea chest. It can be a deck wash, it can be a bilge pump, and you know, really handy, a run off the engine by a belt drive. And that's something I got from the US thanks to Gary. So I really appreciate being given that and it's gonna be super handy and we'll definitely install it down the track. Ah, another question. Will you be stick welding the deck plates or using some other process? Uh, sorry, uh, how is your shore power set up? Okay, so definitely be stick welding them. I really like stick welding, I do. I've, to be honest with you, I've done about five minutes of MIG welding in my whole life. Uh, arms right into it, I've got no clue about it. I really like stick welding because it's simple, you don't have to have gas bottles, uh, you can swap, it's really light gear too, it's really easy to take up the front, you know, no hassle moving it around. And uh, it does a really high quality weld. You know, the weld quality with stick in this environment is basically as good as it gets. Really good penetration, great in a bit of a breeze when you're outside. Uh, you can really rapidly change. Like changing the wire on a MIG weld is a bit tricky, whereas you can sort of put some 7018, do some root passes, do some, you know, 6013 caps or whatever it goes. You know, I'm no expert in welding, but you know, changing different rods is is trivial. You don't hesitate to swap between different types of metal, different types of filler rods. Uh, that's why I really like stick welding. I've got better at it over the process. You know, you've all seen how bad some of my early welds were. I, I'm kind of happy with them. I think, um, you know when a weld's not porous, you know it's solid. It's not necessarily pretty, doesn't mean it's a bad weld, but I think I'm definitely getting my head around it now and, um, and it's kind of my go-to welding process for the boat now. I love TIG welding, that's my other welding. It's actually the only welding process I'm trained in was TIG welding. So I'm looking forward to using that for things like uh, mounting the solar cells, doing the exhaust system or whatever. But when it comes to the steel on the hull of the boat, I think I'll always just be doing stick welding. <laughs> ah, here we go. Vintage Restorations Australia has said, uh, why don't you get a real job? Uh, Vintage Restorations Australia is a mate of mine, Steve. Uh, so if ever you see lots of nasty comments, that's just Steve being Australian, you know, <laughs> it's his thing. Um, and Steve also runs a YouTube channel. He's the one doing the uh, conversion of a Series 1 Land Rover from petrol to electric. I won't answer his question because he's not being serious, but I will say, hi Steve. Uh, he's crook at the moment. He's had a uh, kidney stone, so he's at home in a lot of pain. So sorry to hear that, mate. I had my kidney stone six months ago. I understand how much it hurts and uh, hope you feel better soon, but I'm not answering your question. Uh, next question is uh, from Richard, is what resolution do you expect to get from the side scan sonar? Um, if treasure hunting, will it be fine enough to identify a target? And I think the answer is yes. Uh, it depends on depth though. The side scan sonar in the boat will give us, I, I don't quote me, but I'm, I'm expecting it to work reasonably well up to 20, 30 metres of water. And to be honest with you, most wrecks happen in shallow water, they really do. So it'll be pretty good cruising around the river like this and being offshore this side of the, of the you know, the, the continental shelf. Beyond that, we'll need to tow something. We'll have to have a side scan sonar that we tow to go into deeper water. But I'm expecting to be pretty good in the river, definitely everywhere. 
and uh, certainly offshore up to, I don't know, let's call it 30, 40 metres. I, I don't know for sure, but I think it'll work pretty well up to those kind of depths. Side scan sonar gives you astonishing detail. I mean, I've seen images of things like push bikes in the water where you can see spokes. So I really can't wait to get the engine in and get out there and, you know, obviously get it installed. There's a bit of a gap where it should be at the moment. But uh, get it out there, get it installed and see what we see personally. But from, you know, the, the marketing material you see, and I have no reason not to trust it, you actually get a really high resolution up to a certain depth. So I'm looking forward to getting out there and looking for that, uh, looking with that, sorry. I, uh, I think we'll also use things like magnetometers. I think side scan's great in that you see things that's, that stand out and they're not obviously natural. You know, you see debris fields, you follow them, you find a wreck, whatever. Um, I think between the side scan transducers in the hull, the Raymond unit we're installing, uh, a towed unit and then a towed side scan sonar and then also a towed magnetometer. They'll be the main three sort of wreck hunting bits of equipment I'll be using. Then we'll also look at some, uh, we've got the Gladius Mini ROV we'll use. Then there's also a couple of uh, handheld metal detectors for diving that I'm going to be looking at as well. So that's probably the what's that, five bits of equipment I'll predominantly be using for the, the wreck hunting. Uh, another question is about coating the deck. So I obviously did those, uh, Pete and I did those, um, just those Sikaflex repairs just to stop the rain getting in while I was away and now they're still working well. No water, it's actually been bone dry, so they're great like that. What I need to do is there's actually a tape, like a non-slip tape that was put on the deck. I need to get that up. You can kind of see a striping in the deck. I'll show you in a later video. But you see the striping and that's actually a sticky non-slip tape. So I've got to get all that off before we can do anything. Then I'm going to weld new bits of plate into the deck. I've got a whole sheet of plate, so we've got plenty of steel to do that. But after that, I've been looking at a relatively thick non-slip sort of truck bed paint, that kind of thing. There's a few different brands around, but I'm thinking something like that would be ideal. Something where you can get a little bit of extra sound insulation because the engine's below the deck, uh, a little bit softer underfoot, non-slip, and then something light colored so it doesn't get too hot. They're my main criteria. I haven't picked a specific product yet, but that's what I'd like to do the deck in once it's been repaired properly and all that tapes off, etc. Uh, another guy, Daniel, same guy actually, uh, said, curious, why did I solder the build trunk connections? There's a lot of argument about crimping and soldering. The general consensus these days is crimping is actually best. A lot of people have a really firm belief that soldering is the way to go, but, and I did too. I tend to solder things in the bilge because I've done it for 20 years and I've found it really reliable. I really have. Uh, even if people say, no, 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 you can't beat a good crimped connection, crimp it with enough pressure and it'll, it will cold weld itself. Uh, yeah, that's probably true, but it's very hard after 20 years of having soldered connections get submersed in salt water and continue to work to not give up on soldering in that context. Uh, I understand soldering is not great from a vibration point of view. Um, if you get a short of heats, you can actually have solder melt again. You know, there's a few issues. Solder's not, you know, the gold standard by any, any you know, means. There's a lot to be said for crimping. But I've just always soldered that close to, to bilge pumps where they've been near salt water and I've never had a problem, so I've stuck with it, but I have definitely been converted to the benefits or the, you know, the, the, the pros of crimping, of crimping properly anyway. So I know it's a bit of a dodgy answer, but that's my thinking anyway. So the next question is how much time am I planning on devoting to the wreck hunting diving videos compared to repair videos? Uh, or do I feel I've done all the repair videos I can? The answer is that I probably won't go out of my way to find more repair videos, but it's a boat. Things are going to break. The little outboard is going to need servicing on the inflatable. 
Jeff, a mate, was here today. He's having trouble with his uh, the needle and seats obviously leaking. You know, the fuel's leaking out of the carby on his Yamaha output. We'll definitely do repair videos still, but it'll be more in the context of what happens as things break. I'm not going to gloss over it. If something breaks, we'll just show how it broke and what it took to fix it. Absolutely, you know, we're not going to stop doing that. But I'm not going to necessarily go out of my way to find things to repair. Um, we covered most things on outboards, I thought, before we did the trawler. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a funny thing. Like, you could definitely do it where you went, right, here's how you do a water pump on a, a Yamaha 25 horsepower 996. Then you could do a Mercury 1970, whatever. You could, you could spend your whole life doing water pumps or whatever. And it's just not what I want to do. It's not. Um, I know it's going to upset some people. Uh, a guy was asking me the other day about it and I said, oh, look, I know I'm going to lose some subscribers or some viewers because of it. And he kind of said, oh, it's really arrogant. To... And I said, well, you know, it's my channel. Like, it's just, I want to do fun boat stuff. It's always going to be about boats, you know. Um, I'm not going to do something my heart's not in. Like, that's not what YouTube's about. YouTube's kind of fun because you get to see people following their passion and, and hopefully it's a passion shared by some people and sometimes you're gonna lose subscribers because they've lost interest and you're gonna gain new ones and that's just life you know that's uh, I'd rather do that than find something that's popular and hammer that topic endlessly because it's uh, a market or something you know like that that to me is uh, that's more selling out than just uh, continuing to follow your passion and keep filming it and and uh, hoping that people who also love boats and love diving and love the water follow along, you know. So, uh, you know, it's not going to become a channel where it's all just swimming and filming dolphins, you know. That's not going to happen. But, but no, I'm not, probably not going to um, just start looking for particular topics to, to um, uh, you know, looking for problems to show how to fix. Sorry, that's the long version, but it's actually a really important question to me because uh, when you run a channel, you need to make these decisions and you're not gonna make everyone happy. You know, you're gonna disappoint some people, you're gonna please some other people, but uh, it's the way it is. This question is really interesting. Um, uh, you mentioned you'll be using it for salvage trips. Um, what type of salvage and what are the salvage laws in your area? And I'm kicking myself I didn't bring them because I read that question I was going to bring them. So we might do a whole separate video on this in the future. I'm planning to make the midweek videos a little bit off topic because, yes, people get a bit cranky about it. Oh, I want to see you working on the trawler. So the weekend will mostly be working on the trawler. And the midweek videos will be, you know, just some slightly, uh, uh, you know, some things. I hate the word off topic because it's not off topic, it's boating, you know, that's the topic. But, um, but you know, some slightly different things. And I've actually bought printed copies of all the legislation to do with salvage. So I can probably answer that question in quite a lot of detail, uh, but I didn't bring that legislation with me. So the answer is, uh, really, I think if it's older than 1970 or something, it comes under the Historic Rex Act. Um, but I have bought the legislation. I am very cognizant of there being quite a lot of legislation around that. Um, but I think I'll save that for a separate video on its own. Uh, Dave Kimbler here asked, uh, are you doing wood onto steel or texture on steel for traction? Uh, definitely be doing the, the coating, I said. I'm not a big fan of timber on steel because you tend to get a lot of rust under... If you have a timber veneer onto steel, you tend to get a lot of rust issues between the timber and the steel. So that's something I'm not going to be doing, but definitely going to be doing the, you know, the traction bed we talked about earlier. Uh, Brad said, what do you do to keep yourself motivated on longer projects? And I think it's always about the vision. What do I want to use the boat for? I want to get this boat running. I want to get it seaworthy. I want to go diving, I want to go wreck hunting, and so I want to go fishing, offshore fishing. Uh, so to me, it's all about, I know I'm going to be using the boat. Uh, you could definitely take a shortcut thinking, you know, I want, to, I want to get the boat working as soon as possible. But another part of me goes, you know what, we're going offshore to do this stuff, so it needs to be reliable. So what keeps me motivated is what looking forward to the activities I want to do on the boat. 
and knowing that when I go out there, I want to be able to trust the boat. Uh, Cooper, Leonard said, um, if you were to buy a new engine for the boat, what would you buy? And I think someone else asked a question like, if money was no object, what would you buy? And I've got to say, if the Detroit wasn't in the equation, if it was just an empty hull, it was a boat, it needed an engine, a boat this size particularly, I think what I would buy is a diesel electric. I would buy a nice match pair, good batteries, maybe lithium batteries, lots of solar, maybe even more than I'm going to put on, a diesel generator and an electric motor. You can run the diesel generator non-stop. It's like a submarine, you know. I think I actually think a lot of trains, a lot of boats, I think, work this way these days. They just have electric motors running the props and a diesel generator. And I think some variation of that theme is what I would get if money wasn't an object and I was starting from scratch and not looking to resurrect the, the Detroit, that's probably what I would go with. It'd be nice because when you're just doing a little sunset cruise around the island, you've got some friends, pure electric power. I think the electric power, I looked at one, it was about 100 horsepower or something, which is fine for this boat. Um, they said... Uh, you could do, it was quite a long way. It was like hundreds of miles on a battery charge. So you could do a nice cruise around the island, um, have some drinks on the back deck, run silently. And then when you want to go up the coast, start the generator, run up the coast. I actually think that's a really nice way to rig a boat up. So that's probably the way I'd go. Uh, Glenn. Holcomb said, um, what do you think some of your first treasure hunting, uh, wreck hunting expedition? Uh, I think what I'll do is there's a wreck off um, Wobby Beach. It's a found wreck. It's not a you know a mystery at all, but it's local. There's a sister ship that's actually run ashore up at Bar Point, uh, the Parramatta, uh, which is above ground. So you get to actually look at the sister ship above the water. Um, I think it's gonna be a great wreck to test the equipment. So that's kind of the first cab off the rank. Uh, it's a way of just saying, look, let's test the sonar, let's test you know, the ROV diving, let's see what works, what doesn't work. Then you can start searching for prospective wrecks, undiscovered wrecks. But I think testing the equipment on a found one, such as the Swan off Wobby Beach, is definitely gonna be a first cab off the rank. So we'll do that once the boat's up and running and everything's working. Ah, this question is another really common one I get. It's why does MarineEngine.com sponsor the channel when they don't ship to Australia? When MarineEngine.com started sponsoring the channel, they did ship to Australia, but it turns out that a lot of their suppliers started having exclusive deals with other suppliers in Australia. And you, anyone who's worked in retail knows that you end up with a region. And they've said, right, the US is your region we've given Australia to another company as their region. So they just weren't allowed to, purely just told no, you can't, you know, buy the suppliers. Uh, and that's very common, you know. And so they told me, said, look, it's gonna happen. I said, look, that's fine, you know. The reality is YouTube's an international, um, you know, uh, platform. It's an American company, but it's an international platform. And 50% of viewers of this channel are in the US. 10% uh, are Australia, Australia's second, so I think 50% is the US is the top, 10% uh, is Australia, and the rest of the world makes up the final 40%. So the reality is by far the bulk of the viewers are in a region that MarineEngine.com can ship to. So the fact that the, the, the program or the channel is produced in Australia, uh, is not as significant as where the viewers are from an advertising point of view. So, you know, that's the reality of it. And that's, uh, that's the, uh, the kind of the history of it, how things have changed since the channel started or since the sponsorship deal started. And the reality of an international, you know, uh, broadcast show, you know, if it was shown on local television in Australia, it wouldn't make sense. But because it's shown around the world and the US is the biggest audience, it does make sense. So hopefully that answers that question. Ah, Jerry said, are you worried about the reassembly of your Detroit diesel? And the answer is kind of yes and no. 
I have no concerns about the work CDA has done because, uh, so probably worth mentioning, CDA is a company, I said Arne's been a mechanic since he was a teenager, and uh, Kelvin and Ian who work at CDA, uh, Mitch is doing the work on the engine and he's a, a younger bloke, but um, Arne's known these guys for 35 years, you know, so that was why I just went to CDA, I went like, you know, you and he's never let, never let Arne down. You know, he's had a very long relationship with them and a very long, good relationship with them. So no concerns there. Um, but I do have some concerns in that, yeah, you get this engine back. Um, I'm not an expert in Detroit Diesel. Um, I'll probably give Scott a few calls saying, hey, mate, you know, like uh, what goes on here. Um, but it's... Uh, yeah, you know, I've got to get it running. I don't want to do any damage to it. I'm not familiar with it. Um, look, none of it's rocket science, you know. Once you are a licensed mechanic, as I am, um, you know, you just look at the manual, you get the torque specs, you read through it, you get, you buy the correct sealants, you, you know, you buy quality hose clamps, all that kind of stuff, and it should be fine. Um, I did quiz Scott a little bit about some startup procedures to make sure that I don't um, do any damage in the initial startup and he gave me some good tips there. So I'm concerned in the sense that I'm taking it very seriously, I want to do it right, but I'm not concerned in the sense that if I do take it seriously that it'll be fine. My only other thing is I'd love to be able to start it on the mainland before bringing it out to the boat, um, but whether that's going to be possible or not, I don't know. Uh, Peter G says, uh, any thoughts on the solar setup? You know, he obviously made that comment a while ago, over a month ago. And so obviously we have some solar here. I've got two solar cells on the roof at the moment. Uh, in the end, all six are going to be on an awning over the back deck. I'm not doing that because the awning can't be there when the engine gets dropped in. So once the engine gets dropped back in, which will happen on the mooring here. I'm just going to get the engine to Rob, a uh, guy up the river here, onto a barge. He'll just raft his barge up. We'll do it early in the morning on a calm day, drop it in. Um, then once the engine's in, I can put the awning on the back deck again. I'll put six solar cells, which gives me 900 watts of solar. Uh, and I'll probably even add another solar controller just to handle the full 900 watts. Uh, possibly even a couple so that it's split if there's an issue you know one dies we've still got some solar but uh, yeah the whole back deck that used to be shaded by a cloth is now going to be shaded by a hard roof that is provided by the six solar cells so that's the plan down the track I don't think I'll need any more but if I did if you went diesel electric or something I could easily fit probably another 600 watts on the roof of the wheelhouse as well or even extend the awning to the back of the boat. So there's plenty of space to add lots of solar, and we definitely will have lots. Uh, Earl Portland, uh, good question, is um, what will be your number one luxury item on the trawler? And it's a really good question. I mean, I think hot water would have to be like a number one luxury item. Um, there was the heater, but uh, I don't know, I feel like it's even a bridge too far for a boat this small to have hot water, to be honest with you. Definitely think pressurised fresh water is going to be a luxury this boat currently doesn't have. So we've got the fresh water pressure pump, I guess like 30 psi or something. And I'm going to be putting some fresh water tanks at the back of the boat. So I think the ability just to turn a tap and have pressurised fresh water is going to be really good. Having the fridge hooked up, thanks to Leon. Um, cold beer on the boat, cold whatever. That's probably the other big luxury. So I'd say they're the main two. Uh, and then down below, somewhere comfortable to sleep. You know, having had smaller boats in the past, somewhere you can actually just get on the boat, crash out, lie on a nice mattress with pillows. That's been pretty cool too. All right, well, that's kind of, look, people put lots and lots of questions, but I've been trying to sort of stick to the questions that um, have to do with the trawler, because it's kind of, you know, the flavor of the day. Um, so we'll leave it here, I think. I don't want this video to be too, too long. So thanks for you guys who posted some questions. I hope I answered them properly. Didn't bore you too much. Uh, still need to put the, the Bulma battery monitor in. Because I do have that fridge running now, I'm really kind of just concerned. Uh, I actually pinched the wire on the solar cell and cut it. And so having this battery monitor is gonna be great. That's where you know, you go, hang on, why aren't we, why is the battery just going down, down, down? 
So the monitor really is gonna be really important. I think as soon as you're drawing current, you need to be able to monitor what your batteries are doing. When I was uh, in Greece with Paul, another mate who owns a share in this boat, um, you know, it was this real thing, right? We're in, we're in port, so we've got uh, endless fresh water, endless electricity, but we can't pump out a holding tank. Uh, you're at sea, you can pump out a holding tank, but you can't, you know, you don't have endless electricity, like you don't have endless fresh water. Managing the resources on a boat becomes a real uh, topic of conversation. It's, it's something you really think about a lot when you're on a cruising boat. So having that information is gonna be really critical. So I'm really looking forward to getting that in. But uh, lots of other mechanical stuff to do. I, I do get the sense, you know, you do, you can see from stats that a lot of people aren't particularly interested in electrical stuff. Uh, it's funny though, when I did my mechanics apprenticeship, he said, all right, who here wants to be an auto electrician? <clears throat> and uh, you know, a whole lot of people with their hand up go, oh, I could never do that. And he said, well, you might as well go home now because 50% of the things you're gonna be dealing with are electrical. Um, if you can't deal with basic DC electrical problems, then you can't work on a car, you can't work on a boat, whatever. So I'm not saying you have to love it, you know, that's up, totally up to you. Uh, all I guess I'm saying is that if you do want to restore a boat or you want to run a boat and you want to look after it yourself, uh, I encourage you to sort of start getting your head around some of the DC electrical stuff because um, it's a huge part of the systems on a boat. There's one engine, one prop shaft, one rudder, but there's electric all through a boat. So, uh, you know, it's really something to just start trying to get your head around the basics of, you don't have to become an expert, but it is a really important part of boating. Uh, having said that, I'm going to be doing some more welding soon, getting those bilge pumps discharged overboard. At the moment they run out the engine hatch, so I can't close the engine hatch, which is kind of driving me nuts, I want to close it properly. So we'll be doing that soon and uh, also insulating the engine bay for sound insulation, that kind of stuff. So plenty more non-electrical stuff coming, but if it's kind of one of those things you've been um, kind of ignoring because you don't get it or whatever, it's not rocket science and it is really important. So I do encourage you to sort of maybe start trying to um, come to terms with some of the basic concepts because it'll definitely serve you well. All right, well, thanks for watching. I uh, hope it answers some of those common questions. Thanks to everyone who posted their questions. And uh, on the weekend, we'll get back into working on the trawler. All right, well, take care and I'll catch you then. See ya.